Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Dr. Douglas Causey is Professor of Biological Sciences at the University of Alaska Anchorage and Senior Fellow of the Arctic Initiative, Harvard Kennedy School. He is an ecologist and evolutionary biologist with over 200 publications on a wide variety of topics, including the biology of Arctic marine birds, policy issues related to the Arctic environment, Arctic environmental security, and bioterrorism and public health. I am very happy to welcome Doug. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome from Anchorage. And uh, as, as Becky said, uh, I am a professor here at the University of Alaska Anchorage. I'm also a member of Anchorage Audubon. And so uh, on, on their behalf, uh, I'm, I'm glad we're able to connect. Now, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do uh, today is I'm gonna talk about some of the work that we've been doing uh, in the Aleutian Islands and, and Bering Sea on seabirds. And um, I'm, I'm gonna, I tried as hard as I can to minimize the number of slides with graphs on them, okay? But you'll have to have some, but I promise you there won't be many. Uh, okay, so uh, I think what I'll do is, is um, I will share my screen and away we go. All right, I do this. Uh, <laughs> I live on Zoom for, for teaching classes, but I never seem to get it right. Are you looking at the first slide now? I believe so. Okay. Susan, that didn't sound very positive. I, it's, it has the <laughs> title, Bearing Bear, okay, right, Birds no. and Environmental Change. All right, so like, <laughs> uh, like, like Susan and Becky said, if you have questions, please, um, uh, put, put, put them in the Q&A and, and I'll try and answer as much as possible. All right, so uh, I, I, I am going to talk about um, for some, some of the research we're doing and also why we even started this. So this is the Bering Sea and um, the, the uh, area on the uh, right-hand side, well, that would be Alaska. And on the left-hand side is Siberia, um, 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 Japan and some others. The area that, that, that's in between those arrows, that's this mark WCE, that stands for Western Aleutians, Central Aleutians, Eastern Aleutians. With one exception, there's nobody living out there. And so in, in with the, the one exception is, is uh, where the sea is, that's, that's Adak Island. And from time to time, you can actually land on a plane, but generally we use a ship. And I wanted to show you the ship that we use. This is uh, uh, the research ship run by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, the name is pronounced Tekla, that, that's, that's an Aleut name. And <clears throat> just so you can appreciate uh, the, the challenges of working out there from the port in Homer, Alaska, to Attu Island, which is at the very end of the Aleutian Islands, which, which many of these pictures come from, um, is about 1,800 kilometers. The ship goes, on average, about 12 miles an hour. So this is like going from where you are in Delaware to almost the Mississippi River going 12 miles an hour. So you now can appreciate the problems of working in a place this large. Okay, so uh, this picture is actually taken at, uh, at two and uh, um, uh, I wanted, I, I have some other pictures like this in here just to give you a sense of what the Aleutian Islands are. Uh, so th th this is at two. This is a, an island near Adak and in the middle uh, and um, uh, th th these are rather static pictures. Uh, I'm, if, if we're lucky, I'm gonna be able to show this next image. Okay, I'm stopping. Are you, are you able to see it? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so, so what you're saying 
is a flock of least oculets flying to their colony. And uh, they're flying to their colony on an island called Kiska Island. And the Fish and Wildlife Service attempts to census the number of birds. You get the idea. The closest we can get is there about a million and a half. <laughs> There's so many birds, like I'm gonna show you in the next picture, you can't count these. And they're constant, constantly in motion. And so when we do bird censuses, it's, it's like, well, it's, it's, it's more than 100,000 and less than a million. So let's throw a dart and pick something in the middle. The point I'm making here is, is that this is an extraordinarily productive area and um, about roughly about half of all the seabirds in North America are found in the Bering Sea. All right, and then uh, uh, how we get to in, anywhere that we're working is, is from that very large ship, the, the, the Tekla, we're using small boats like this. Now, um, not to put too much emphasis on this, but there is no infrastructure, there is no Coast Guard, there is no rescue. Um, uh, be because there's, th there's hardly anybody here. So, so the work we do, as you'll see, tends to be very isolated and um, uh, we're very safety conscious. I'm gonna come back to this island in a minute and uh, but Becky and I, uh, um, excuse me, Susan and I have figured out how to show these, these videos. This is an example, a classic example of some of the, the seabird breeding areas in the Bering Sea. So um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, keep track of the time and uh, so Susan will we'll show these um, at, at the end of the, at the talk about what this landscape looks like for seabirds. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you some bird pictures so, so, so that, that you all stay with me here. <clears throat> some of these I'm sure you've seen. Uh, and, and so in, in, in most of these slides, what I have is the Latin name at the top, the, the, the common name in the center, and then the bottom is in Russian, uh, because almost all of these birds are, are distributed not only in the U.S. Aleutian Islands, but, but the Russian ones as well. Sanderling, you all know that. Dunlins, these are uh, birds that are that are all breeding uh, on the uh, in, in interior of the islands. It's a nice picture of a bird sandpiper. Red knot, curlew sandpiper. Um, uh, really interesting bird. Okay, so now I I, I prepared you that you're going to have to look at some charts. I pro again I promise it it, it won't be many. <clears throat> What we're talking about is environmental change. And, and uh, uh, on the horizontal axis of this thing is, is showing you years. And, and underneath it, uh, um, you're also seeing kind of a, 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 a description of what, what the climate was in the Bering Sea on a, on a very broad scale. And then that mess of curves there are, are the population abundance of key species in the Bering Sea. In 1975, there was a dramatic change from cold climate to warm climate, 1975. And it had, as you can see, a pretty immediate effect on populations. Then from 1985 to 1990s to 2000, things went back to pretty much the way the Bering Sea was, well, now we're in, in a warming period. Now the, the point of the work that, that we're doing, this was such a profound change in the, um, both the abundances as well as the distributions of birds that we wanted to see, could we first uh, um, quantify what was the effect of climate change on breeding seabirds? And, and second, uh, could we make some predictions about what's gonna happen? All right. Um, uh, I, this here is a list, uh, and, and it's based on, in, in 1882, this, this was one of the first 
uh, uh, bird surveys done on Et Etu Island. These are the species that were most common, the dominant species, red-legged kittiwakes, red-faced cormorant, whiskered auklet, and then stellar sea lion and horned puffin. Uh, I'll have pictures of most of these. 2020, <laughs> those species were in some cases not even there anymore. And these were the species that, 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 that were now, now dominant. We're seeing this pattern happen uh, uh, through, through, throughout the Aleutian Islands and the other islands in the, in the Bering Sea. Dramatic change in the species that, that, that are breeding there. Uh, I'm gonna come back to this, not in as, as certainly not in as great detail, but, but to, just so you understand how we can uh, talk about some very general patterns of, of um, um, nesting, foraging, diet ecologies of the common seabirds. And uh, it's, it's essentially, if we, we, we can pretty much group seabirds um, together in ecological groups by looking at where do they nest, where do they feed, and what do they eat. And this picture here, <clears throat> um, uh, my wife tells me this looks like every island in the Aleutian Islands. Uh, there's there's gray water at the bottom, uh, fog at the top, and then there's green habitat in the, in the middle, uh, which is kind of true. Uh, what I what I wanted to show this to you is is that this from a seabird standpoint, this is the diversity of landscapes, border rubble. Beach. This is like um, uh, shorebirds would would would, would uh, be there. Talus slopes. This is what um, um, most of the auklets are, are breeding in. Cliffs, puffins, kitty wakes, cormorants. Ledges would 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 also be um, um, mers. At the, at the very flat is probably going to be more gulls, and then then burrows are going to be puffins. All right. The, the, the point of this picture here, uh, and, and then tundra would be a lot of the uh, uh, um, grassland birds that they saw at the beginning and that, that, that we'll see later. Well, here's the problem. <laughs> here's the issue that, that um, seabirds have, not, not just in the, in the Bering Sea, but, but, but all over, that they um, are superbly, designed to feed in the marine environment. And in that ch chart that I showed you before, we, we can typify whether they're onshore, nearshore, or, or offshore feeders. They do extremely well. The problem is birds have not evolved how to lay their nests in water. So if the food that they eat moves away from the areas that they breed, like what you're looking at, there's gonna be a big problem. And that's partly what we're seeing, that the, the environmental change is affecting the distribution of their food. Well, um, this, this picture here, which, which, which has all of these different habitats, um, that's a common thing to find in the Aleutians, but not every place, uh, uh, not every island in the Aleutian Islands um, uh, works out for, for every breeding species. Okay. So uh, um, uh, in, in, in the very simple kind of analyses that, that, that I'm gonna show you later, um, we're just talking about diving fish feeders like pigeon guillemots, horn puffins, my favorite bird, red-faced cormorants, common murs, pelagic cormorants, tufted puffins. Diving plankton feeders, crested auklets. Lock of swing gulls, everyone knows gulls, okay. All right. So now uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some background on uh, this, this uh, great idea I came up with. And um, uh, the, the, the problem, particularly in a place like the Bering Sea, is that there is a lot of work done on fish. There is like management work done by the Fish and Wildlife Service, but there is very, very little scientific research done comparatively. And so um, to understand what, what the 
dynamics of, of the uh, seabird populations have been, there really are not very many studies. And so the idea I had, because I had this, this great colleague who you'll hear from in fall, who is a zooarchaeologist, and I'll explain a little bit about what they do. Well, they're archaeologists, and so they're very interested in, in understanding what the uh, early people did um, uh, uh, back in time. This is on Bull Deer Island, which we uh, uh, have, have done a lot of seabird research. And those moundy looking bumps uh, right in the front, as you see, those are not, not hills, but those are the old deposits of where the early Aleut people threw all their garbage. And through time, it just made layers after layers, and that's what the archaeologists excavate. And I uh, have this inset picture of um, to, just to make the point of this is extremely isolated research. And so um, the, the research vessel Tekla drops us off on the island, uh, honks its horn and away it goes, and then they don't come back for about eight weeks. Okay, three more gratuitous pictures of some really great looking birds. Um, uh, it, eagles are extremely common in the, in the, in the Aleutian Islands. So are albatrosses and um, black oyster catchers. Okay. Well, this picture is to um, warn you that, that, that I'm not going to get into some of the technical details of what, it, <laughs> what the archaeologists did. I'm laughing because you'll see uh, how I was able to um, convince my colleagues to do a lot of work for me. All right. This is back to Bull Deer Island, uh, and um, um, that, let me see if I can get my pointer there. I, I, don't, know, I don't know if my, my pointer shows, it doesn't look like it's showing, but it's, it's in the upper, upper left-hand side. It look, look, looks like a little um, uh, white dot. That is the, the, that's the cabin, the tent on, on Bull Deer Island, and what you're looking at this picture right here is the site of a former village. Well, what I, <laughs> God, don't tell Debbie this. Uh, so, 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 so what I did was, was um, uh, I, I, um, I, I, I talked to Debbie, the, the archeologist and another colleague, uh, two colleagues, as a matter of fact, who are also archeologists, come out to the Aleutian Islands and start excavating Think of all the great things that you're doing. And so archeologists are very careful. You, um, you don't just dig a hole. They, they, they make these excavations that are very precise and, and they're measuring the depth and all of that. And then um, uh, from, from each of those layers that you see on the left-hand side, you'll carefully with like tweezers recover the material that's in that. Then they take Put these into screen boxes as you see put them over, go over to the stream and then they wash all the dirt away and what's left as you see on the right hand side are all the material that was left behind by the early Aleuts. This was my contribution to the Aleutian zooarchaeology was I offered advice. Okay <clears throat> well just to give you an idea, uh, uh, this this is just a, a an, an insert picture of, of of what the material looks like when it, when it's excavated, and all those different bones that have arrows to are actually from, from those species, and right in the middle you you see there actually is a carved implement. That's what excites the archaeologists. Actually, all of it, but the but but in the, in particular any of the artifacts. All right, and then a great picture of a tufted puffin. I mean, come on. See, there, there. Uh, this I took um, right at the at the beginning of, of the breeding season. All right, to get back to what the zooarchaeologists do, they go through that stuff they pull out of the excavations and they sort them into different kinds of bones. And and this is what. Um, the zooarchaeologists, that's their first step after they get everything back from, from the field as is, is they sort things out. And, and I will show you uh, some specifics really quickly about 
how I can then use this material that's been laboriously excavated. I cannot tell you how difficult and how, how difficult this is. You're, you're, you're in a pit in the rainy Aleutians pulling little bones out of the side with tweezers. All right, different kind of bones, birds, mammals, fish. Uh, mammals are primarily uh, sea lions and, and uh, otters. Uh, and there's also um, uh, invertebrate sea urchins and, and, and some others as well. Okay, now I'm gonna go really quickly through this. I, I just want to make the point about um, uh, have, after the zooarchaeologists have done what I consider to be the difficult work, then uh, uh, the ornithologists can look at what the remain what what those bird bones are, and first identify what the bone is, and second, what species it is. And I'll give you some examples about how we do that. Okay, I'm going to give you um, just just show you three three examples, um, and uh, all of you know these bones, I, except maybe for for the feet. But but if you ever eat a chicken, okay, um, you you would uh, know what the coracoid is. And, and the ulna, okay? Um, uh, and the, the coracoid is the bone that, that, that attaches to the sternum and the ulna is just part of its wing. All right, <clears throat> this is a coracoid, all right? And uh, uh, I, what I wanted to show you is that first, this is what the bone looks like when, when it's excavated out, out of the midden. And second, if you look closely, you'll, you'll see that there's a little tiny notch at the bottom there. That notch was, was made by us. Uh, we we um, took a little bit of bone out and then processed it, processed it. And then we can use both um, uh, biochemical analysis as well as genetic analysis. And we can tell a lot about the, the organism that that bone came from. Again, these bones are there because the early allele people ate them. Okay, so <laughs> uh, I'm gonna show you three, three more pictures like this. And this is just a document that, that you take a bone like that. And, and if you uh, 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 have, have studied a lot of the osteology, the, the, the bony anatomy of birds, then you can tell the different species apart. And I, uh, the, 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 the ones I'm going to show you, I only have two more slides here, um, are telling the difference between pelagic and red-faced cormorants. All right, so um, that's on the coracoid. This, this is a bone called the tarsa metatarsus. Again, you, you, you see there's a section taken out that we use for analysis. And this is the bone that, that um, connects the, the um, uh, bottom leg of the bird with what we call its knee, but, but actually its ankle. Okay, so uh, uh, what you're seeing here is pictures of the different, uh, 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 the tarsometatarsis of pelagic and red-faced cormorants, and then the anatomical features that we use to differentiate if they come from a pelagic or a red-faced cormorant. Okay, one more, and I won't show you any more. Okay, this is at the other end of that tarsa metatarsis. Okay, and that again, we're looking at characters which are pretty distinct. I mean, here here we're looking at is there a pit or or is it um, uh, uh, smooth? Uh, I'm showing you this picture here again for you you to, to, to appreciate some of the challenges. This is the ulna. This is the wing bone. And you'll appreciate that this um, doesn't look like the other bones in that this is just the center part. Those bumps on the top, that's where the feathers attach on the wing. But who is it from? There's a lot of bones that come out of a midden that we just simply cannot identify. <clears throat> All right, so to, to give you a break from that, I'm, I'm gonna show you some more bird pictures. This is a white rump, this is a sandpiper. Uh, purple sandpipers, th those have a really unusual call. Western sandpipers, pectoral sandpipers, little stint. There's another rock sandpiper. Semi palmated, uh, really nice to see out, out on the islands. Okay. 
so <clears throat> remember back a couple of minutes ago, I showed you that chart of being able to categorize the different species of seabirds on uh, what they ate and where they ate it. Uh, got it. Well, this is the, this is what you're looking at on the um, uh, uh, the those those columns says A, B, C, and so on. Those are the layers that the archaeologists have excavated. And then I and and then underneath is is how old these are, and they were dated you, you, using radiocarbon dating. So um, the the layers uh, A, B, and C are roughly about 890 years before present. Uh, e, F, and G is roughly a thousand years earlier than that, and uh, layers uh, L, um, uh, I, J, and K are about 2,650 years ago. So, um, uh, if there was no change in the um, distribution and abundance of birds, then you would see these, these uh, colors between black for near shore, gray for fish eating birds, the, the open for planktivorous birds, the proportions would be about the same. But instead you're seeing that there is variation. All right, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you that this picture grouped by, by these very broad uh, groups, near shore, fish eating, plankton eating. Uh, but we look at the actual species um, uh, as, as well. Okay, Amchitka Island is um, closest to the mainland, well, in the Aleutian Islands, it's um, uh, ab about 500, 600 miles from, from, from the Alaska coastline. Bull Deer, I showed you some pictures of that, is about um, 900 to 1,000 miles from, from the Alaska coastline. And here you see a big difference. And also the time scale is, is different. Okay, the, the uh, earliest that, that uh, the archeologists were able to get to was about 1200 years ago. Let me back up and I'll show you that 1200 years ago would be about layer C. This is on Mchitka, this is on uh, Boldir. All right. Um, <clears throat> Another thing to appreciate uh, uh, is that uh, we, we're talking about um, occupation of the Aleutian Islands 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Remember how far it is to get uh, from, from, from the mainland to, to like Attu? How did the Aleut people get there? Well, they're in kayaks and they paddled that entire distance not in one day, one week, one year, one decade, one century. Okay, that, that's, that's something that the archeologists are very interested in finding out is, is, they just, is, is how Aleut people moved westward through, through the Aleutian Islands. For us, we're, we're using the, them, their, their uh, activities on the island as sampling the environment. Regardless, we look at this and see on Boldir Island, there has been a big change in just 1200 years between the birds that the Aleut people could catch and eat, and even like in a 300 year period. All right. <clears throat> now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how can we actually measure climate change or the environmental change. Well, the, these data are from Bering Island, which is uh, in, in, in the Russian era, excuse me, the, the Russian area, but it's only about 120 miles from Etu Island. And so uh, now you're getting used to this on the, on the horizontal axis is time. And uh, we always put the present that would be zero on the right hand side and then everything that goes to the left is getting older and older in time. And then you are looking at um, uh, the, um, uh, on the vertical axis on the right hand side, it's, it's measuring what the change in temperature is from the present. And that is that dotted line. On the left hand side, it's showing you the change in sea level. And that's what that very dark line. 
Okay, so if you go back about 3,800 years, and that's where that red line intersects the uh, curve there, we see that the sea level difference is about two meters higher than it is now. Why? Because there was a, a widespread warming event. And so ice and all of that warmed and melted, it went somewhere, it caused the sea level to rise by six feet. Well, what that did for, for the island environments is now you're flooding the, the coastal margins. And, and, um, uh, in, and in, in, in these islands, what that did was produce lagoons, estuary, estuaries and lagoons of very high productivity. Well, <clears throat> this is going to be attractive to some birds like shorebirds and not so attractive to uh, birds that don't feed in fresh water like puffins and the rest. Okay, then um, uh, at about eight, uh, 1800 years ago, this is where the red line intersects the, 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 the bottom there. Um, the, it, it became colder and this, this caused the sea level um, to um, decrease. And what this did was it expanded the coastlines just because the sea level is decreasing by about 200 meters, intertidal areas by about 500 meters, which meant that the Aleut people had more places to feed, to, 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 to gather food. It also meant that the birds which feed near shore now had more opportunities to feed on the things that they eat. So the, these two things I wanted you to see is, is uh, that, that, that how just this, this difference, the, the uh, temperature can affect dramatically coastlines and, and in an um, environment like this, how this changes the natural habitat for, for the birds that are breeding there. All right. <clears throat> These are shear waters, and uh, this 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 is not a contrived picture. This is what shear waters look like when they um, um, uh, are um, disturbed out of their feeding area on water. And in, in this case, it was the Tekla going the Tekla going by. I hope this gives you an impression of the the immense number and density of of seabirds here. The next couple of pictures I'm going to show you are some other um, indications of how the temperature actually was changing on a on a geographic basis, and and these values are um, done by um, uh, uh, researchers who look at diatoms. These these are freshwater plankton, um, and and some other species. And by knowing how sensitive each species is to temperature, they can make a pretty good guess of what the temperatures was like. So uh, uh, the, what you're seeing here is 6,000 years ago that, that the Aleutian Islands were, um, and the Bering Sea Islands were, the, the blue dots mean they're pretty, uh, about two degrees annual temperature cooler. The precipitation in the Aleutian Islands is wetter, and that's and and and, and we're looking at the bottom curve there. That that's that's the Aleutian Islands. All right, the the so here's some more evidence about how dramatically different the Bering Sea region has changed um, in 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 the immediate past. So I'm going to show you um, um, uh, some distributions uh, uh, of 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 course the the most interesting bird there is, uh, red-faced cormorant. This is another common name for it, the, the red-faced shag. That, that um, again, we're, we're looking at Alaska on the right, Siberia on the left. Um, the Aleutians are at the bottom. That, that red area there, that is the current present distribution of red-faced cormorants at present. Okay. 1400 years ago, red-faced cormorant bones were picked up at these other sites that are in red and not detected uh, in the areas that, that are open circles. 
3,200 years ago, uh, red-faced cormorants were common up in the Bering Straits uh, and in the Chukchi Sea, uh, but mostly were restricted to the very far Western Aleutians. And 4,400 years ago, it's another distribution. Okay, so what I wanted to show you there was that um, um, not only do we get a difference in distribution at particular islands, but on a broad scale in the Bering Sea. Now, I'm going to add another um, uh, um, twist to what we're talking about. The yellow dots that, 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 that you've seen there um, refer to, on the left-hand side, you'll see a cormorant with a bright yellow face that looks awfully similar to the red-faced cormorant on the right, except that the one on the left has a yellow face. And it turns out that not only is its plumage different, but all those bone characters that I showed you before are also different. And so you can identify um, whether this particular form um, was in middens or not. And again, what you're seeing in, in those, uh, those, those, uh, Yellow dots and the ones I showed before are evidence from archaeological excavation of middens. All right, so this is the distribution of yellow faced shags. What is a yellow faced shag? I'm sure some of you are asking because if you look in your, your uh, AOU list of birds, you will not see yellow faced shags. It may be a plumage variant with, with some differences in, in morphology. We're, we're doing genetic analysis right now, and um, it looks like they, they certainly are distinctive. You can identify them from red-faced cormorants. Are they a different species, a subspecies? Um, that, that we don't know. Now, Debbie um, Corbett um, in fall is going to talk a lot more about this, um, but particularly with the birds on, uh, excuse me, the, the people living on St. Paul Island, which is the Pribilofs, north of where we are, about 500 miles in the middle of the Bering Sea. But the um, uh, uh, both the the early natural historians who went there in Attu in the 19th century. Um, 1930s and and uh, some some uh, anthropologists who who talked with some of the former residents on Attu Island. By the way, there's no one living on Attu Island now. Well, one of the projects they did was was to get the names, the Aleut names of the birds that live on Attu Island. And what was very unusual, and this is one of the anthropologists contacted me about this is that there were five names for cormorants. Now, everybody who's listening to me knows what a cormorant is, <laughs> okay? <laughs> There's no confusing a cormorant with any other kind of a bird. And a cormorant is pretty much, they're, they're um, very similar to each other. But the Aleut people had five names, Atniganax, which meant it's near in the bay. Ingatux, neck in winter. And what that meant was that they, they, the Aleut people would hunt the winter cormorants and the, I don't know if you've ever seen these, but they would take the neck, the, the neck plumage after they, they, they killed the bird and of course ate it. But it, it ends up being like a rectangle and they would make these beautiful robes out of the, um, um, uh, skins. Tanatakak, really good to eat. Ayuga Namak, it's some, something seen far at sea. And then Niatkak, it walks in summer. Well, um, <clears throat> we then went, went to some of, some of the uh, Alia people who are familiar there and um, with, with, with uh, the seabirds of the Bering Sea and showed pictures and were able to match up the names of the Zaliut names with the descriptions with pictures. Okay, and so 
the Aleut people had five different names for cormorants, and we've found five different forms of cormorants. The one that's in yellow, Pallas's cormorant, is extinct. And uh, the very unique thing about Pallas's cormorant is that during breeding season, it's unable to fly. It's unable to fly because uh, um, in non-breeding season, they're right at the edge, the, 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 right at the edge of being able to fly because they're so heavy. Well, they, they, they uh, fatten up for, for breeding and they're not able to fly anymore. So that's where I'm gonna go backwards now. That's where the name Walks in Summer came from, is that the palace's cormorant, which was found on Attu Island, no longer is extinct now. The early Aleut people um, uh, uh, recognized it and called it, had a special name for it. Well, why I'm putting this is that these, the, the, the ones in red are some, some, some other unusual forms of cormorants, which again may be subspecies or plumage variants, we're not sure. But based on what the people pick the, um, from, from, from the pictures and since some other uh, clues, it looks like that there may have been five different types of cormorants. Okay. Uh, we're almost done. Uh, well, almost about we're ready to leave um, uh, at two. Uh, th th this, this is a sunset. Okay, and uh, I, I now have some other great pictures to, to show you of tufted puffins. Oh, a red-faced cormorant. Temic sting, dotteral, spoonbilled sand viper. Look at that Hudsonian godwit. We don't see gray rump tattlers very much, but um, I, I like this picture a lot. Um, let me see, um, and then some, some waterfowl, northern pintails, old squaw, stellar zider. These are all birds that, that, that are breeding in the, in the Aleutians. Uh, spectacle eider, king eider, Canada goose. Let me see here. I may have to skip ahead. I think I'm getting near the end of my time and I got too excited on bird pictures. Just a minute here. Um, hold on a minute. Oh, darn it. I knew this would happen. All right. Hold on, everybody. Uh, I think I will stop here on the eider. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, that, that's, that's a very brief overview of some of the work that, that we're doing uh, in the Aleutian Islands on, on seabirds. Um, well, what I focused on was, was pretty much the zooarchaeology. This, this gives us a background for uh, understanding what the dynamics are um, uh, uh, that, that we're observing right now uh, in breeding seabirds. So um, uh, I, will, I will stop here. There, I've stopped. <clears throat> How did I do, Becky? Did, did, did I hit the time? You hit it wonderfully, and we do have time for uh, that fantastic video that Susan and I were fortunate oh. to see. Excellent. Okay, Susan, let's see it. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Okay, this. This picture is taken on from. Oh, yeah. sorry. St. Matthew Island, which is in the middle of the Bering Sea. Nobody lives there. It's a, it's it's extremely difficult to get to, uh, but but we go there every three or four years to do bird census. Um, that that little boat there. Uh, you look closely, and I'm sitting in it. Okay, and then one of my students is operating the drone. Um, <clears throat> Susan, uh, why, do, why don't you go to the last one on P P Pinnacle Island? Okay, I wanted to show you this picture because this is so classic Bering Sea Islands. Um, uh, what you're seeing here, uh, again, by a drone, um, is where fulmars are breeding in this isolated island off St. Matthew Island. 
And uh, up until like a couple of years ago, when the Fish and Wildlife Service started using drones, there was no way to even estimate what the breeding population of some of these colonies are. And, and as you can see, there's absolutely no way that, 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 that a human being is going to be able to get up to these colony areas and do any kind of a census. And this was such an exceptional day, I'll tell you. It was be, because usually this, these islands are covered in fog. And if you remember at the very beginning, this was that island I was showing you almost covered in fog. Hey Susan, if we have one, if we have time for just another video, well, why, why, why don't you do the other one, the, the the one we didn't show, this one? Okay, so what so what we did here was in the boat we we went into that um, underneath that little cave here, and so what you can see here is this th those things that look like columns. This this is the remains of the old volcano. We're actually in a of of um, uh, an old um, extinct volcano, but here's the point. The very top of that, you see all those white spots? Those are, this is another, until now, unknown breeding colony of fulmars. Again, because the, the, these islands are covered in fog, <laughs> you can't possibly get up there. And, and even with the drone, you, you would be unable to, to, to see. So um, uh, the, the work that the, um, um, Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge, which which is where all of this this uh, work um, is is covered, um, is is really able to get a lot more work done. All right, that's all I got. Um, <clears throat> are there any questions? Is there is there political challenge to getting to these middens? Is it tricky to gain access to? Uh, no. I'll tell you why it's not tricky is, is uh, that the zooarchaeologists work very, very closely with the Aleut people, okay? 30 years ago, yes, I mean, and there was some really bad stuff done where like bodies, well not bodies, but skeletons were, were excavated out of the uh, ground and put into museums, not anymore. So um, uh, it's just done very much in a collaborative way. Thank you. If anybody has questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A section. Um, I'm also monitoring the chat box. So if you type it in the chat box, we'll see it here. Also, we can relay. We'll give people a minute. That was awesome. I, I love your drone videos. Those are great. Um, we do have a question that just came in. Are current censuses accurate enough to determine trends? The answer, it, uh, are the current censuses accurate enough? No. Um, can we detect trends? Yes. And, and uh, even though the censuses are not that accurate, you saw how difficult it is. It's that some of the trends are dramatic. For example, when I first started working uh, in the Aleutians in, in, in Attu, I was an undergraduate. My, my students are convinced I got out there with um, on Vitus bearing sailing ship, okay? Um, so, so, so long ago. When I, when I, was, when, when I first started work on, on red-faced cormorants, breeding, in, in that group of islands around Etu was about 45,000 uh, red-faced cormorants. Two years ago, when I was there, we couldn't count 300. That is the kind of change you can detect even though the census may not be very accurate. And some of the changes, it's not like everything is decreasing. In some cases, the, the populations are increasing. And at first it was thought, well, maybe species are just moving you know, from one island to another, but it doesn't appear to be that at all. Another question is, do you have a photo of a fulmar? <laughs> I have a photo of a fulmar. Um, <clears throat> Now that means I have to find it. Uh, I do. I thought I had it. I thought I had it in my slides. So hold a minute. Okay. While you're looking for that, okay. um, there's another question about if all the islands have been photographed by drones. 
no 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 um uh the the <laughs> probably six okay so again if you remember okay i do have I, i'll tell you what i have a lot of pictures of seabirds i will send uh, my my presentation and I'll, I'll add full mars to it and and the, you, you can get to it then um remember about the 12 miles an hour okay um <laughs> and um time moves on and, and and here's the thing about shipboard work is is that if if your ship is moving westward like what we were doing to add to that means that you can't be doing anything in the eastern illusions because your ship is in the wrong place so it is very much as dependent on what the schedule is and, and and the research and i do have a um a quick i'll share my screen this is just um off of, uh us oh, I... website as an image of a fulmar um just so that you have a visual um oh, I... Okay, I'm sorry. I guess I assumed you all knew what a fulmar was. Okay, wait, that came out sounding wrong. Uh, fulmar is not very <laughs> fulmar is not very common in Delaware. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, we're actually um, Delaware at Seagull Audubon Society, so we're in New York in the Cooperstown Oneonta right, area. Right. Um, uh, the fulmar is a prosilariad, which is related to albatrosses. So they have a the common name is tube nose. And so um, it looks like a gull at a distance, but up close you see that that has like that albatross uh, bill. Um, one more question. Um, are some birds more protected because of their remote location for breeding? Do we see less decrease in them? You mean in, in the, the, the birds that I was talking about in the Aleutians? I believe so. Yeah, okay, well, um, <clears throat> Uh, there is no direct interaction in, uh, be between the birds and, and humans. It's, it's too isolated. There is a lot of indirect in interaction, like with marine debris, like, like floating fish nets. And this is the case all over the world. Um, plastic in the environment and that. Uh, on, on the East Coast, because uh, there's a lot more people and a lot fewer colonies, um, uh, there is a lot of effort for um, uh, preservation, conservation that of seabird colonies, but it's not, <clears throat> it isn't the same kind of an issue, I guess is what I'm saying in the, in the Bering Sea. And, and another question, why did the population of cormorants decrease so dramatically? Has the human population increased a lot? You mean uh, on, on Attu? Yeah, okay. I, There's nobody living. Okay, there's nobody living on Attu. Uh, and <clears throat> there's no industry. There's no shipping routes. Uh, that's what I've been trying to figure out for about 15 years. I don't have an answer, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. That looks to wrap up the questions that are in there. I'll keep and continue to keep a quick eye out for them. Okay. Uh, well, th this is, I, I really have enjoyed this. Thank you so much for, for the uh, uh, invitation. The images and, and the videos that, that, that I provided um, uh, use on a personal basis. Is it okay for us to post the webinar on our website? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we will have a recording probably mid to late next week. We'll have it online. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you again so much. Um, it was wonderful and such a privilege. Okay. And so invite me back next year and I'll talk more about cormorants. <laughs> that sounds Thank perfect. you. <laughs> thank you so much, Doug. It was fascinating. All right. Goodbye. Yep. And to our guests for this evening and our attendees, thank you all so much um, for coming out with us tonight. Um, someday we'll be back in person, um, but we hope to continue to offer opportunities like this on Zoom as well. Um, take a look at our Facebook page, visit our website, www.doas.us. Thank you again and good night. Thanks, everybody.